All right, everybody. We've got a few more people rolling in. I just want to say it's pretty awesome that there's 160 people that have joined virtually tonight for a free avalanche awareness class. Um, I'll get us kicked off here. I'm Susie. I'm the marketing person at Ascent Outdoors located in Ballard. We are excited that we're still able to hold this event, even though we're a little bit sad we can't do it in person, but hopefully next year we'll be able to come together once it is safe to do so. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass the torch off to Haley. Thanks so much for joining tonight, everybody. Good evening, everyone. My name is Haley Darby and my preferred pronoun or she or hers. And I want to welcome you all to tonight's Avalanche Awareness Program and say a huge thank you to Ascent Outdoors for hosting tonight's event. We rely on so many parts of our community to make NWAC a success. It's because of people like Susie and places like Ascent Outdoors that help us get the word out about Avalanche education. And it's definitely a bummer that we can't be together tonight in person, but I still really appreciate Susie for taking the time to host this event and all of you for tuning in tonight. And before we get started, I do wanna make time to have an indigenous land acknowledgement. Ascent Outdoors is located on the ancestral lands of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Stillaguamish, and Coast Salish tribes. And tonight I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Absoluke, Salish Kootenai, and Cheyenne tribes. As I said, my name is Haley Darby and I'm one of the Avalanche Awareness Instructors for the Northwest Avalanche Center. Besides this, I'm also a University of Washington student and I'm about to finish up my bachelor's in environmental science. Along with being a student, I'm also a forestry technician with the US Forest Service and I work on trail crews in the summer, but I'm hoping to pursue a career in guiding as well as snow and avalanche forecasting and education. My involvement with NWAC began last season when I participated participated in their female mentorship program, but really it was taking an avalanche awareness course like this several years ago that really sparked my interest in this area, and I am super excited to be working with NWAC this season instructing these courses. And tonight I am here for the Northwest Avalanche Center or NWAC. NWAC is a partnership between the U.S. Forest Service and our nonprofit organization. And we're here to provide you, uh, the community, with avalanche and mountain weather forecasts, educational and outreach opportunities, and events. We are here for you. And as I mentioned in the chat, now that you know a little bit more about NWAC and myself, we'd like to get to know a little bit about you. So if you follow this link in the survey, you're going to be asked a few very simple questions. And this survey is just to help us send you some follow-up information and educational resources after for this class. So I want to be clear that you aren't signing up for a mailing list, but we just want to capture how many people are here and what you like to do in the mountains. And like I said, this will provide you with those follow up resources after tonight's event. So if you just type that link into your web browser or you can hold your phone up to that barcode and a link should drop down. But I'm going to give you all the rest of that minute and 15 seconds to fill out that survey and then we can get started with the presentation. We've got about 10 seconds left. So hopefully you've been able to fill out that quick survey so that you have access to those resources. And as a reward, I'll play this video of Belle. This is one of our forecasters, retired avalanche rescue dogs. And in this video, cool. she's 10 and a half years old, yep. but she's still going strong, yep. breaking trail through that 
heavy cascade snow. Oh, go. I also want to acknowledge this whole Zoom e-learning thing. I think that many of us are getting used to this by now for better or for worse. But in tonight's meeting, I ask that you keep yourself on mute. And I believe in this webinar function, you can't even take yourself off mute, so that works great. But please use the chat function or the Q&A function to answer any of my questions. And I'm gonna have Susie moderate the Q&A and the chat function so that I make sure that all your questions are answered either during or after the presentation. So, First, let's start by understanding what we like to do in the mountains. If you can all locate your raise your hand button, when I show your preferred travel method, click on the button and let me know by raising your hand. First up, we have snowshoers. How many snowshoers do we have out here? What about backcountry skiers or people that are planning on getting into the backcountry this season? Awesome. How many of you ride or snowboard? Or how many of you are backcountry sledders or are planning on backcountry snowmobile riding? And finally, how many of you are winter climbers? Awesome, thanks for sharing. So I just want to take a second and applaud you all for being here. Simply by attending tonight, you are taking the first step in proactively keeping yourself safe. And I want to state quite plainly that avalanches are an inherent risk of winter mountain travel and avalanche accidents and fatalities occur every year in every single travel type. So tonight, I want to help you take those first steps towards safety by helping you first understand avalanche risk by recognizing how you and your team choices impact the level of risk that you encounter in the mountains. I also want you to be able to utilize your local avalanche center that serves as a resource for information and education pertaining to avalanches and winter safety. I want you to understand what some basic avalanche rescue gear is as well as identify the need for continuing avalanche education. These learning outcomes are really important, but I also wanna add one more, which is get excited about winter. Yes, avalanches are real and they are really dangerous and they can kill you. But in general, winter recreation is an awesome sport. And if you take time to plan and learn, you can minimize your risk. So get excited about winter. It's super fun and the Pacific Northwest is getting no short supply of snowfall already this season. So when I talk about winter recreation or backcountry travel, what am I actually talking about? Does this apply to a ski area or if I'm driving over Snoqualmie Pass? And yes, while avalanches exist in both of these areas, there are teams of professionals that work there to help manage the risk for you. However, anytime we recreate outside of a ski area or a snow play area or a highway, we're on our own. So as soon as you cross that thin, thin rope line or hike away from the road, there's no one but you and your team that's managing your risk. So now we know where we're talking about, but how about what we're talking about? What is an avalanche? Can you type some just thoughts about what you think an avalanche is in the chat real quickly? What do you think in basic terms it might be? Yeah, awesome. A lot of these are really good. Thank you so much. Yeah, they're all correct and it's really basic. It's just a mass of snow that slides downhill. Three simple things. So this means that it can be big or small, wet or dry, but when we have a mass of snow that's sliding downhill, we have an avalanche. And when those avalanches interact with people, we have avalanche risk. 
And it's easy to think about these avalanches and avalanche accidents and think, wow, that is way too risky. Maybe I should just stay inside or stay in bounds all winter. But when we check the statistics, we see that greater than 90% of avalanche accidents are triggered by the victim or someone in the victim's party. So here's a question that you might be surprised to hear, but how does that make you feel? Seriously, how does that make you feel? What does that mean? At first glance, to me, it seems kind of scary, but when I think about it more deeply, it's actually a source of hope for me. If this statistic was that 90% of accidents were random acts of the universe against you, I'd probably be terrified and definitely wouldn't want to spend much time in the backcountry. But this says that 90% are due to the party. And that means that our decisions matter. Where we go, where we choose to go, where we choose to not go, shapes our risk. So that means it's up to us. And so a little information and learning can go a long way. We talked about avalanches being a mass of snow sliding downhill. Based on that definition, we need three things to have an avalanche. What's one? Can you throw some answers in the chat? What's one thing we need to have an, for an avalanche to occur? Right, we need snow and we'll call that unstable snow. Next, we need a hill or a slope and we're gonna call that avalanche terrain. And then we need something to set this whole thing in motion, which is what we call a trigger. When we have all three of these pieces, we get an avalanche. We put these three things together into what we like to call the avalanche triangle, which is unstable snow, avalanche terrain, and a trigger. Each one is a leg of the avalanche triangle and you have to have all three. So on any given day, I know from statistics that I make a really good trigger. So I'm that leg. The only way to remove it is to stay home. So what we wanna find out is what avalanche terrain is and where we can find unstable snow. And that is where NWAC comes in. NWAC is here to provide you with mountain weather and avalanche forecasts, education and outreach opportunities, as well as community events. Here's a photo from NWAC's main page, and on it, you can see the updated avalanche forecast. This map right here shows you the 10 zones that NWAC operates in. And before you go outside, you wanna make sure that the forecast you're getting matches what zone you intend to recreate in. And just because the color is the same doesn't mean that the forecast is the same. So in this photo, you can see that there's a yellow color covering all the mid to south cascades, but each of those different zones has a specific forecast for that zone. Another thing to note is that gray doesn't mean there isn't a forecast. So if you plan to recreate in the Olympics or in the Southeast Cascades, there's a unique forecast for that area. It just, the lack of coloring means that there isn't enough information for the forecasters to produce an updated um, avalanche danger scale rating, which is that color. Much like the weather forecast, the avalanche forecast changes daily. So you're going to want to check for the most up-to-date forecast before your trip. NWAC avalanche forecasts are issued every evening at 6 p.m. for the following day. So what we're seeing right now, um, or what we were seeing for today was given to us at 6 p.m. on Sunday night. And that's great because it helps us plan for what we're going to do the next day but I would always recommend checking the avalanche forecast in the morning, just in case there are any updates. And on NWAC's page, it provides tools in, and information for all three parts of the avalanche triangle, which is unstable snow, avalanche terrain, and a trigger. And you're going to be able to find that information in the danger rating and the bottom line. And we're gonna talk about where those are. You'll, and you'll be able to find information about the danger rating and the bottom line once you click on each of these specific zones. Most mountainous areas of the US and Canada are covered by local avalanche centers and you're able to find all of them at avalanche.org or avalanche.ca. 
even though the formats of these different organizations are going to look a little bit different, the ideas and the concepts are the same. So avalanche centers all over are going to provide you with information about unstable snow, avalanche terrain, and about the trigger yourself. And while there is a lot of information, we are going tonight to focus on just the danger rating and the bottom line as places to get general information. So let's start out with the first leg of the avalanche triangle, unstable snow. This can seem kind of like a daunting question. How do you know? But it really doesn't have to be that complicated. Even though the snow under your feet might seem uniform at first glance, it's made up of layers. Different layers form with each storm and the weather between those storms. Snow melts, wind blows it around, and more snow falls. Some layers are weak, some are strong, and ultimately it's the differences in these layers that create that unstable snow. So even though the surface might look all the same and inviting, there is a lot going on under you as you travel. So unstable snow is snow that wants to or can slide downhill. NWAC will provide you some basic information about the snowpack each day and the avalanche danger rating and bottom line. Then we always want you to look out for avalanche red flags that can be clear signs that snow instability is present. The avalanche danger scale is a tool used by avalanche forecasters to describe in general terms the snow conditions and associated risk across large areas or zones. It's a scale from one to five and has associated definitions and travel advice. So when you go onto NWAC's homepage, like I showed you before, you'll see each zone colored with the highest danger for that zone for that day. The first sentence of travel advice will give you a quick idea of how unstable or how much unstable snow there is. When the forecast is considerable, you'll see that the forecaster thinks that dangerous avalanche conditions exist. When it's low, we think that it's generally safe. So this first sentence should leave an impression on you about what conditions the forecaster expects. The bottom line allows the forecaster to expand and give some context to that unstable snow. Sometimes, like when it's at a moderate rating, the forecaster may believe unstable snow is in lots of locations. And in this case, the forecaster believes unstable snow is probably associated with slopes near and below cornices and drifts. It provides a succinct summary for what could happen and what the snow might look like and some travel advice. But the danger reading is only a starting point. You have to look for yourself. Do you see any signs of unstable snow? Red flags are simple, obvious signs that unstable snow might be present. One of the first red flags to look out for is recent avalanches. This is one of the easiest signs. If you see recent avalanches, unstable snow is present in the area. Cracking and audible whoops are both the unstable snowpack failing under a trigger. If these slopes were steeper, it's likely they would avalanche. And again, it's a pretty easy sign of unstable snow. And then we have weather clues like warm, sunny days, or big snowstorms, rain on snow events, or lots of wind blowing the snow around. These may all create unstable snow. And we like to think about it as in, when it comes to weather, big changes mean big problems. So I just wanna reiterate that these are the red flags you should be looking out for. They're simple observations that mean unstable snow might be present. So how do you know if the snow is unstable? The danger rating provides a general idea. Then the bottom line can provide ad additional nuance. You'll see this pattern continue for all three legs of the triangle. I wanna stop here and ask if I have any questions about unstable snow or things to look out for when you're traveling in regards to snowpack itself. I don't see anything coming in, so we can move on. But Susie, anything that you noticed? 
Uh, there's a few popping up now. Perfect. Uh, does the cracking refer to a sound or a visual? The cracking refers to a visual and the woof is kind of that um, audible sound that you're going to hear outside. But if you are crossing a slope and you see that snow cracking around you, that's definitely a sign of unstable snow. Um, we've got some questions about like when you dig a snow profile and I think you're gonna eventually get to that. So some of these questions will be answered shortly. Um, how do you identify a recent avalanche? That kind of might go hand in hand with unstable snow. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would say ways to identify an avalanche is by looking, we'll talk more um, about avalanche terrain in the next portion of the presentation, but things that are obvious signs that an avalanche has just occurred is large debris piles um, at the stop zones of avalanche paths, which we'll learn to identify, um, as well as visible crowns of avalanches um, up above in start zones. Why don't we answer one or two more and then I can move on and we'll have time at the end for some questions. Um, and when it comes to interpreting the color rating for danger, is it a linear increase in a danger or exponential? That's a really good question. Um, I would say that the increase is exponential. If you even just reading through the uh, travel advice given for each increment in the avalanche danger scale, you'll see that going from low to moderate to considerable can really jump in terrain that you should avoid or um, stay out of. And it, it really depends on what, cause they're not all the same uh, travel advice every time, but the danger increases massively as you increase the, um, go up the scale. And one that also kind of goes on this is uh, level of snow determine the danger. That kind of goes hand in hand with unstable snow. That's a good question as well. I would say that obviously when you have, it's less about how much snow there is and how well those layers that we talked about previously are bonding to each other. And you're gonna find out more about what to look out for and what specific layers you should be thinking about through that avalanche forecast. And generally you'll find when we have really big storms, as I think the Cascades are getting a big storm even tonight, you'll see that the forecast I presented earlier and the forecast for tomorrow have changed dramatically due to the large increase in snow. So hopefully that answers that question a little bit, but it really depends more about what kind of snow is falling and how those layers are bonding to each other. Why don't we do one more question and then I'll move on to avalanche terrain and we'll have time for more later in the presentation. I had a question come in through the Q&A box. Can there be smaller areas of high avalanche risk in a large area labeled low risk? For example, a particular slope being much higher risk than the region overall. That's a good question as well. And those kind of nuanced um, aspects of the forecast will definitely be presented to you if you read it. It really depends on weather and terrain, um, which uh, we can't really dive into so much given not since we don't have like a lot of specific examples for this presentation, but it's definitely possible that you could have certain pockets, aspects, or terrain features that could be higher danger overall due to wind, due to other factors versus the entire or like a broad generalization of the area. And you're gonna find information about that in the avalanche forecast. Thank you all for those questions. I really appreciated them and we will have time for more later in the presentation, but I'm gonna move on to talking about avalanche terrain. So the first leg that we talked about was unstable snow and the second is avalanche terrain. 
And remember that avalanche terrain is just our fancy word for where an avalanche can occur. But let's learn a little bit more about it. Often we think of steep slopes as being avalanche terrain, but that's only part of the story. Avalanche terrain is anywhere an avalanche starts, runs, and stops. So if you're in any part of an avalanche path, you are in avalanche terrain. The most obvious part of avalanche terrain is that start zone, that steep and open slope. And what do I mean by steep? I'm talking about 30 to 45 degrees, which is like a steep blue or black diamond run at any ski area. By open, I'm thinking sparse trees. If you can move easily through it, so can an avalanche. So look at this photo I have right here. Can you see any steep and open slopes? But that being said, we can't forget the runs and the stops part of avalanche terrain. Often these areas can be less obvious, but if you notice a change in vegetation and there's a steep slope above you, chances are you're somewhere that an avalanche can run or stop. The lack of vegetation, the type, the height, these can all give you clues. So when in doubt, just put more distance between you and any steep open slope. Again, we're going to want to look to the danger scale for our initial impression of what avalanche terrain the forecaster thinks is dangerous today. Under high, you see that travel in avalanche terrain is not recommended. That means in starts, runs, and stops. However, under moderate risk, the forecaster believes that certain, terrain, certain features of avalanche terrain, not the entire thing, might pose a risk. Bottom lines give us some further detail. In the top bottom line, the forecaster warns um, and cautions of going on any slope greater than 35 degrees. The forecaster is worried about you traveling in start areas that are steep and open. However, they aren't as concerned about you traveling where avalanches could run and stop. Now, I might not wanna have a picnic in a stop area, but I would travel through it. Versus in this second example under high danger, it says stay away from all areas where avalanches can start, run, and stop. So we look to the danger rating and to the bottom line for information about what avalanche terrain might be dangerous today. But just like unstable snow, there's always something we wanna look out for. And these are called terrain traps. Terrain traps are anything that can magnify the consequences of an avalanche. So in this photo I'm showing right here, can you see anything that might magnify the consequences of an avalanche, even where a small avalanche might be really bad? I know for me, I'm seeing some trees and rocks. There are cliffs up here, gullies there, and creeks and lakes. Even small avalanches could have really big consequences in this type of terrain. So again, avalanche terrain is anywhere where avalanches start, run, and stop. You're going to want to look to the danger rating and the bottom line for avalanche terrain specifics the forecaster is concerned with. And you wanna pay attention to the consequences like terrain traps. So does anyone have any specific questions catered towards avalanche terrain, start, run, and stop zones? And if you do, I think it might be easier um, to pick through them if you throw them into the Q&A function as well. Uh, could you elaborate on what a terrain trap is, why it's named a trap? That's a really good question. Terrain traps are areas, like I said, that magnify the consequences of an avalanche. And they can range from um, being things like cliffs to gullies. And they're traps because they an avalanche might occur. And if you get caught into a terrain trap, it means that besides the 
um, bad, bad situation of that avalanche happening, it is magnifying the consequences and making it even worse. So for example, um, an avalanche occurring and there's a cliff below you, that could really magnify the consequences of that avalanche versus if it had just been a steep open slope. Or let's say that there is a steep rollover and a flat section underneath that rollover. If a bunch of snow comes down and you're buried in that flat section, that snow that has piled up is going to be so much deeper than something that had any sort of angle to it. So those are just anything that can magnify those consequences and make it so much worse. And you want to be checking out for those when you are traveling in avalanche terrain. Um, we've got a question on the definition of crowns and cornices. I can elaborate on that briefly. I would say that that is something that you cover more in an ARI 1 course, but um, crowns are visible start zones of avalanches. It's where that snow breaks and starts to slide down the slope. Cornices on the other hand are not um, signs of avalanches. They're just features of snow and wind combining. And um, when wind blows a certain direction, it can sometimes build up snow facing a certain direction. And that can sometimes build a certain um, angle to it or something like that. And um, that creates a cornice generally found on ridge lines um, or things that are wind affected. So cornices and crowns are two separate things. Um, crowns are associated with avalanches and cornices are just a snow feature when it's related to wind. And that kind of goes hand in hand. We've got some tree wells as well. Would what you just said kind of align with the same situation? Yeah, um, tree wells are uh, when the snow is uh, quite a bit deeper surrounding a tree because um, the space that the tree provides allows for the snow to create a hole basically next to it. And those are things that you need to be looking out for um, even inbounds at a resort um, if you're kind of on the side on off-groomed areas. Um, but I would also say that tree wells could serve as a, a source of a terrain trap as well. Um, but when related to avalanches, they don't have the same impact as like a cliff or a goalie or something like that. And we're also getting a few of the same type of questions around estimating slope. And I know that does kind of go more into an area course as well, but would you wanna talk a little bit about the numbers and slope when measuring terrain? Yeah. Yeah, slope estimation is definitely something that you will learn more about in more advanced avalanche courses. But like I said, the prime numbers for an avalanche to occur are between 30 and 45 degrees. When you have a slope that's below 30 degrees, it's generally just not steep enough for that snow to slide and gain momentum. And that's why you'll find you'll find that cracking and that woofing on uh, slopes with unstable snow, but it doesn't slide because it's just not steep enough. There have been certain situations where slopes that are between 27, 28 have slid. So you have some margin margins around that, but um, 30 to 45 degrees is generally what you wanna be looking out for. And then slopes that are greater than 45 degrees are generally just so steep um, that they are, snow is going to slide off them in general. Um, cliffs that are 60 degrees or really steep coulars are just going to slough on their own. Um, not that you shouldn't be taking avalanche precautions, but um, it's really the, that key zone is that 30 to 45 degree slope angle. And um, along with that, determining slope angle is something that you do get into more with an advanced avalanche course. Um, but there are certain things that you can purchase like inclinometers and things like that, that go more into estimating slope angle. But um, that is again, more some more advanced avalanche knowledge. Any, any other questions you were noticing or again, we'll have time at the end. Maybe I'll take one or two more. Yeah, can you elaborate on how identifying vegetation or lack thereof 
and the height of provides information about avalanche risk? Yeah, that is a really good question. And like I was talking about, let's see, trees um, before are, um, or the lack of vegetation is a really good way um, that provides clues for if you are in an avalanche path. Um, if you notice a big steep open slope and um, you don't have much vegetation at the top and the trees are sparse as um, it gets down the slope, it's pretty clear to see that a lot of snow um, is going through that area often and um, it's not allowing for trees to grow in that area. Um, another way to tell is um, how tall those trees are. Um, some really big avalanche paths can take out huge trees. And so if you see smaller trees, you can see that um, and generally if they're surrounded by more forested areas, you can see that there were trees there at one point, but some large event like an avalanche took those trees out and now they're just starting to grow back. And then there are certain features about trees in general. Um, one term is called flag trees where you just have all the branches on one side of the tree generally facing downhill. And it's because that uphill side is getting pummeled with snow due to avalanches. So those are just some examples of how vegetation can provide you some clues about um, where an avalanche path might lie. How about one more question and then I'll move on to talking about the trigger. How specific can avalanche forecasters, sorry, how specific will the forecast be when identifying avalanche terrain? Will you always know where that you're in avalanche terrain? That's a really good question. And I think that you are going to be given in the forecast some clear, some slope angles perhaps, or some uh, things to look out for, but they aren't going to, they're, they're broadcasting for a really large area. So they're going to give you aspects of slopes, slope angles, certain terrain features to look out for, but they're not gonna be following along with you as you're in a drainage near Snoqualmie Pass. And so that means that it's up to you to be understanding what they're talking about when they're talking about slope angle and talking about slope aspect and then applying that to whatever terrain that you're traveling in. And so it's up to you to be recognizing what north aspects are and what aspects that are 30 to 45 degrees are and to be looking for those avalanche start run and stop zones. So it's definitely a combination of interpreting that forecast for your plan for the day. All right. Thank you all for those great questions. We'll have time at the end again for more, but I'm gonna move on right now to talking about the trigger. So the last leg of the avalanche triangle is the trigger, and we need something to set this whole thing in motion. And often that's us. We make really good triggers. Earlier, I talked about this statistic. 90% of fatal avalanches are triggered by the victim or the victim's party. Why did it give me some comfort at least? It means that we have control. So what information can NWAC provide us about the trigger? They can give us travel advice. And again, we'll see that in the danger rating and in the bottom line. But it, ultimately it's you and your partners that, that make the choices that control your risk. The first half of the danger scale definitions dealt with unstable snow. The second half deals with our response to it. How should we, as the potential trigger, travel? The travel advice under the considerable tag mentions careful snowpack evaluations, cautious route finding, and conservative decision making. Under the low tag, it wants you to watch for unstable snow and isolated terrain features. So there's definitely a difference between those two recommendations. Again, the bottom line provides an added layer of nuance. It gives you simple actions and answers, what can I do? And it also answers questions like, what do I look for? What do I avoid? And what do these features look like that I should be avoiding? Ultimately though, it's you and your partners that determine your own risk. The decisions you make provide either increased safety or increased danger. So you wanna choose your partners wisely. 
There are plenty of people that I'm good friends with that I don't recreate with, not because they're bad people by any means, but because I want folks that are good communicators and that have a similar level of risk acceptance that I have. So in, in review, we make really good triggers, but it is our actions that keep us from being an avalanche trigger. Ways that we can avoid being that trigger are by understanding the danger ratings in the travel advice, and by looking for simple actions in the bottom line, and by choosing our partners wisely. While the danger rating and the bottom line aren't everything, they are a starting point for you and your friends to understand the general conditions, where, where the forecaster thinks avalanches are likely to occur and what you can do to prevent an accident. It gives you information about unstable snow, avalanche terrain, and the trigger. But once again, ultimately it's you that controls your own risk. Some simple ways to reduce your risk on any day would be to choose lower angled slopes, avoid areas where avalanches can start, run, and stop, and stay away during elevated danger. But what if an avalanche does occur? What then? We call that avalanche rescue. And while I can't teach you all about that in a class tonight, I can help you identify the tools that you will need to carry out a rescue. Every member of your group needs a beacon, a shovel, and a probe, as well as knowledge on how to use them. As a group, you're also going to want communication gear, first aid equipment, and other emergency gear like a shelter, extra layers, and extra food and water. And these three items, a beacon, shovel, and probe, are the core avalanche items that you need if you're going out into the backcountry. You're going to want a metal shovel, basically to dig up um, anything, anyone, if, if a avalanche were to occur. A probe is a collapsible metal tube that's quite long and is able to poke around in the snow for anything that might be buried. And an avalanche beacon or a transceiver um, emits a radio signal and it's something that you wear on your person that allows for, if an avalanche were to occur, it allows people in your party to switch their beacons onto a searching mode that picks up that radio signal that's being emitted from under the snow. Uh, all transceivers today operate on the same international standard, so you don't need the same model, but everyone in your party needs to have an avalanche beacon, a shovel, and a probe. I would also really, really encourage you all to take an avalanche rescue course. These are single day programs that are taught throughout the winter that help you practice the skills to carry out an effective avalanche rescue. These skills are perishable and you need to practice frequently to stay sharp. So we have covered a lot tonight. You took the first steps in your avalanche education and what can you do now? Here are four simple steps you can take this winter to increase your skills. First, read the forecast frequently. Understanding the snowpack from the start of the season to the end really helps give you context when you're making those trips out into the backcountry. Second, consider an avalanche rescue course or a level one course, which will expand your avalanche knowledge and go more in depth into topics that I'm not able to cover tonight. Three, choose some lower hazard days to go out and gain experience. Try to identify avalanche terrain while you're at a resort even or on those lower hazard days. And fourth, get out and play in the mountains and start thinking about the snow under your feet and what could be avalanche terrain and things like that. The avalanche forecast and avalanche education are only a starting point, but ultimately it's you that determines your own risk by deciding when, where, and how you travel. NWAC and other local avalanche centers are here to support you. There are a couple of ways that you can stay connected with NWAC. First, you can get the forecast. Reading the forecast frequently will help you feel more comfortable and provide context when you are going out into the backcountry. If you're on social media, follow us on Instagram at NWAC US. Some educational opportunities we offer are laying tracks, which is a once a month uh, once a month seminar 
um, or webinar program for travelers that are looking to take um, and expand on their avalanche knowledge past just an awareness course. And these laying tracks offer gear, mountain weather, interpreting the avalanche forecast, as well as navigating avalanche terrain. And I would like to put a plug out for this program because I believe that tomorrow night on the 12th is our first laying tracks seminar of the season. We also just recently released um, something called Backcountry Basics, which is a new program that goes over interpreting the forecast, gathering the proper gear, and continuing your education with more advanced classes. And you're able to access this resource by going to the education tab and fo um, following the link there. And it's something that I would really recommend if you're a bit Zoom fatigued and want to just read something online versus coming to a course online. And finally, you can become a member. 65% of NWAC's funding comes from our members. So join your community avalanche center wherever you're located. Now, any other questions that we have that I didn't answer through the course, I will let you know that you will receive a follow-up email with resources. Um, and you'll also receive a class experience survey, which I would love if you took a minute or two to fill out as well. But for now, um, we've got some time to answer your questions. Um, just while you're on the topic of laying tracks, we have Teresa wondering if it costs anything or if it's a free uh, webinar. That's a really good question. I am not positive for sure, but I believe that because it's a webinar, it is um, available for free uh, this season. Generally, they do, when we do these classes in person, they do come for a small fee, about $15, I think, but um, I would have to double check and I can while we're answering questions, but I believe that these courses are um, free to the public this season. Great. And we had a really good follow-up question to the first ski video that you showed us at the beginning. Yeah. Um, was there anything that the partner could have noticed to avoid in that area that caused that avalanche to be triggered? That is a really good question. Let's see if I can scroll back. At the end of that video, it kind of talks about what the forecast was for that day. And... Um, See, we're back on it and so here is a quote from the victim he ended up in a terrain trap and went um, from being above the snow to two meters below the snow in seconds and here is a summary of what happened that day and so as you can see um the slope angle was 35 to 40 degrees. And I believe that um, I saw that the forecast said it was considerable for that day. Um, it's hard to know because this is uh, something that happened in Switzerland where you, we aren't familiar with um, quite what the snow was like or what those layers were looking like, what sort of layers they were dealing with. Um, but I think the takeaway from this is that you can see uh, this slide occurred in prime avalanche terrain and um, he ended up in a terrain trap which magnified his consequences. Um, but because uh, all rescuers were um, outfitted with that avalanche gear, they were thankfully able to dig out this, uh, the person buried in a quick amount of time. Um, but that's as pretty much a, what I can elaborate from um, this being far removed from it. But that's a good question to consider. And then this was a clarification question. Um, is a stop zone where there is any change in vegetation? Yeah, I would say that a stop zone um, can will also have changes in vegetation because stop zones are where that debris is going to be piling up. So it's definitely going to be affecting any sort of vegetation that's located um, in that um, stop zone where that debris ends up lying. So you will probably find a, um, less vegetation or trees that are flagged, um, things like that. Awesome. And then is there a resource that uh, states the stats about days of the year, seasons that given regions are in 
different danger levels. I know this all kind of is dependent on snowfall and snowpack, but um, yeah. yeah, I guess that also kind of ties into to that that forecast, that daily forecast. How often is that changing? How many days is a region at level three considerable? And I'm sure you yeah. can answer that. That's a that's a really good question, um, but something that I know I can't answer, and I don't believe that we have data on that, just because it is so weather and seasonal dependent. Um, because we don't know what the what the season is going to bring, um, we really only know um, just a day in advance or a few days in advance, uh, according to what the weather forecast is showing, um, and so things change all the time and it's not like something that happened one year ago could be predicted to be the same um, the next year at a certain location. Um, so that's why staying up to date with the forecast and especially just being really familiar with it throughout the course of the season um, can be really helpful. And then these kind of go hand in hand. Um... Avalanche ratings, are they only isolated to NWAC? And then are there different avalanche terrain maps for different zones? Ooh, okay. So the first one, um, no. The North American Avalanche Danger Scale is that scale I discussed before. And um, most, uh, I would say probably all forecast centers in North America, so Canada and the United States, utilize this danger scale um, to present their forecast. And so that danger scale from one to five, let's see if I can go back to the slide that was talking about that. Um, that danger scale is um, used across all forecasting zones. So I know that right now I am using the Gallatin National Forest Zone and I know that yellow on my forecast zone means moderate. And I can look at the NMAC zone and know that yellow also means moderate. Obviously those have two completely different forecasts, but they are using the same avalanche danger scale as a tool. And then could you repeat the second question you said, Susie? Yeah. Um, are the avalanche terrain maps uh, for different zones? And I think that was specific to what's on the NWAC US website. Oh, yes. Um, I, I think what I'm interpreting your question as is that each of those 10 zones has a unique forecast. So you might have a couple of zones with the same coloring, like um, here's a good example. You have um, these five zones, they all have the same coloring. They all have a moderate um, danger scale provided, but each of these zones has a completely unique forecast. So it's going to say different things um, because uh, snow and weather impacts those areas of the mountains differently. I hope that answered that question. And here's kind of a, a hard question to answer because it varies on the situation, but should you find yourself in an avalanche, what should you do? You, um, better hope that your friends have education and gear to help get you out of it. Um, that's basically the simplest answer. Um, I would say that pursuing further avalanche education like an ARE 1 course or specifically a avalanche rescue course will help you have a better idea of what this actually looks like. Um, but if you were to be caught in an avalanche, there really is nothing you can do as long as I hope that you would have an avalanche beacon so that they can find you. But really it's up to your party um, and what gear you brought with you that um, will be the most helpful in a situation like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that kind of goes with the question about avalanche airbags. Um, and uh, sorry, I just missed it. But uh, yeah, are there certain types of avalanche dangers that would indicate using an avalanche airbag? Um, or is that more advised to help mitigate the risk if an avalanche does occur? Yes, um, yes to that final statement. Uh, avalanche airbags are a tool that is um, an extra measure of safety that you can take um, to if an avalanche were to occur. Um, 
I would say that if you have it, I would just have it every time you go out into the backcountry. But really, the goal is to just avoid being in avalanches in general. Like, you don't want to be using that airbag. Um, so the best way to not or to know when to use your avalanche airbag is to just not ever get caught in an avalanche. And that's like the simplest and most annoying answer. But um, yeah, if you have one, that works great, but it's not going to um, say like it might help, but and that's something that you can go more into in an airy one course, but um, it's just another measure of safety and it's not going to prevent you from um, getting caught into an avalanche if you were to enter avalanche terrain. We have someone asking if you personally, Haley, have ever been in an avalanche. That's a good question. Thankfully, I have not yet found myself in that situation and I hope that I never do. Um, yeah. There we go. <laughs> I've I've really um, recently moved to Montana, and uh, the snow here is much more reactive. So I'm enjoying learning more and gaining a lot more respect for the snow out here versus back in Washington. But no, hopefully the answer will always be no. Awesome. And then we have uh, two questions related to hiking through avalanche zones and and shoots and then someone just clarifying if you said that you can traverse a stop zone. Okay, I'll answer that um, last question first. Um, traversing a stop zone is going to be dependent on what the avalanche forecast has provided. So I think in my example I mentioned there was I provided two bottom lines and in one of those bottom lines it talked about how um, it was a high avalanche danger. Let's see if I can find the slide. High avalanche danger and travel in all avalanche terrain was not recommended. Um, yes, here it is. Travel, stay away from all areas where avalanches can start, run, and stop. So this means that you don't want to be traversing that stop zone because you are still um, in the path of an avalanche and the snow is unstable. Versus in this upper one, um, it talks about uh, using caution on slopes steeper than 35 degrees, but it's not specifically talking about staying out of those stop zones. And like I said, I that doesn't mean I want to be hanging out in a stop zone. I don't want to be spending a lot of time there. But with that type of forecast, I feel comfortable traveling quickly through it to get onto my other location or destination. And then um, does that answer those first questions about hiking and shoots or was there... Um, more to that? I think you did a good job covering that. Um, another good one is, is there a recommended minimum group for a rescue? Um, having at least one other person. So that is, uh, that's one thing you have to think about if you are traveling solo in the backcountry. Um, but obviously uh, more Greater, more hands mean lighter work, um, but you wanna ma manage um, your group size with just how many people you're going outside and feel comfortable traveling in the backcountry with. So my personal preference is three people, maybe four people. Um, I generally travel in groups of two to four. Anymore, I um, avoid, I just think it makes things complicated when I'm in the backcountry. And um, if I'm traveling solo in the backcountry, I am not entering avalanche terrain. Let's see. Whoops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, what are some of the common threats and dangers in the Pacific Northwest? Are there any specific events or known frequent terrain traps and danger areas? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, from my, and I'm gonna answer this just from my personal experience, um, but the Pacific Northwest is heavily treed. Um, also it's in certain areas, there are a lot of really steep um, cliffs and gullies to watch out for. So I do think that a lot of our backcountry terrain has a lot of those terrain traps that we discussed. Our terrain is really, it's complex. Um, it can be difficult to find beginner backcountry 
tours and locations in Washington just because we have such complex terrain. Um, and then was it um, snowpack? Uh, what was the start of that question about certain, oh, things to watch out for with our snowpack? Um, let's see, from my, again, from my personal experience, um, we have a lot of rain on snow events. So that creates unstable snow. We also just get a lot of snow out here. Um, and so that can lend itself to creating a more dangerous snowpack at some points, but at the same time, a more, um, a safer snowpack at other points. So again, it really depends. And another nuance to that question is just, we have uh, such a range of weather across the West Cascades, the Olympics, Mount Hood to the East Cascades. It really depends on your destination and where you're going. Yeah, and that, I think that kind of covers a question that, that just came in on how are they determining these forecasts? Like, are they measuring them daily? Is it based primarily on weather? And that's a great answer because it's, it's so complex out here and different snow in the Cascades versus mm -hmm. down on Rainier. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, um, how do you estimate the size of a stop zone? Ooh. Um, I would say that you can generalize the size of a stop zone just by um, seeing how um, widespread those shifts in vegetation or debris are. So um, basically as simple as that, as looking and seeing, oh, this um, area I'm traveling through has like 500 feet of section where the trees are substantially different than the trees surrounding it. And um, that is just a pretty basic way of estimating that size and just being cognizant of it as you're traveling through it. We've got a question on uh, distance between your group members when traveling in avalanche terrain. Is there a recommended number or any guidance on that? Um, yes, I would say that um, let's see, recommendations for how you're traveling in avalanche terrain is um, definitely more of an advanced um, like airy one topic, mm -hmm. but uh, you have the right idea of wanting to separate your group members when you are traveling in avalanche terrain. Um, I am unaware of a specific number. It really depends on the size of terrain that you're traveling through. But in general, you want, if you are in avalanche terrain, you wanna make sure that your group members aren't stacked on top of one another. So whatever it takes to make sure that if something were to go, you all wouldn't be caught, um, that's what you wanna be um, employing when you're outside. Great, and then a non what would non-avalanche terrain be like in the backcountry in the Pacific Northwest? Heavily forested areas? maybe for someone who's wanting to go snowshoeing solo, flatter areas? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So non-avalanche terrain is going to be terrain that is below that slope angle that I gave. So slopes that are between um, or just under 30 degrees um, is not considered avalanche terrain. Or like you mentioned, heavily treed areas um, are generally, uh, generally contain much more stable snow and um, those are like, you You will have to be reading the avalanche forecast because if it is in that slope angle, it has the potential to slide, but um, going in those uh, lower angled slopes is a good way to avoid being an avalanche drain. Great, and I just got uh, one last question that might be a good one to finish up on. Um, if there was a remote avalanche without anyone caught, is it something to report to anybody, maybe specifically NWAC? Yes, that is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, NWAC wants to hear about anything that you see in the backcountry related to avalanches. So it, you don't have to be associated in any way with it, but if you see any sign of avalanches occurring, whether it's natural or triggered by a skier or something like that, you should definitely submit your observation to NWAC. Take pictures. It it doesn't have to um, be an intimidating process. 
they, uh, they want any sort of information that you have, whether that's pictures, a small paragraph, or if you are more of a um, more excited about this and have a bit more knowledge and can describe um, ex in more depth what actually happened according to the snowpack and things like that. But they, they want your observations no matter how big or small. Awesome. And just one more quick one that came in. Um, they were asking how they can gauge an angle. Maybe if you want to talk about the thing that you can like stick on a ski pole. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that guessing angles is something that, again, is more of a advanced avalanche topic, but there are certain tools that you can use. Um, I'm sure there are probably cell phone apps that do this. Um, there are also tools uh, called like inclinometers that you can hold up to slopes and uh, they will tell the slope angle of what you're looking at. There are also specific tools that you can um, easily place on a ski pole. Um, but those are things that are, again, more of an advanced topic and stuff that we don't cover in these avalanche awareness presentations. Awesome. I think that covers a lot of the questions. I know they were coming in on both sides, so I apologize yeah. if I um, missed anything. Um, yeah, I think that's all of them. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to talk about snow and avalanche safety. I really enjoyed getting to get all of you excited about winter recreation. And if you ever run into me in the backcountry of Washington or Montana, please say hello. Um, but thank you so much. And I hope you have a good evening and 